One of the things about having the last talk of the day is that uh, a lot of times much of your material that you plan to uh, present has been covered. The good thing is that gets you out of here a lot quicker. So that's going to be the case here. And I, by the way, it sounds like we're have, they're having a lot more fun over there than we are here. <laughs> we gotta make some noise. Yeah, I guess. Okay, uh, that's a, my disclosure slide in a place called Sedona, Arizona, up in Boynton Canyon. If you ever want to go there and visit, if you want to break the bank, stay in a place uh, called the Enchantment Resort. It's spectacular. Wonderful setting, but it'll set you back some money. Okay, so what I did was for lymphedema, I, I chose to look at some things, uh, myths about lymphedema and some facts about them. This is a little bit controversial, but I wanted to, I, I was interested enough in this paper, so I wanted to present it to you. You can see, as Peter showed, showed us on the right side, the, uh, uh, the various stages of lipedema. Uh, the, the first myth is that lipedema is just fatter, painful legs, primarily in women but there isn't any uh, objective diagnostic criteria. Well, in fact, uh, lipedema is really disproportionate increase in the fatty tissue in the legs or arms. It is accompanied by a sensation of pain and uh, heaviness. They do have a tendency to develop hematomas, and really the waist circumference to height ratio is probably a better measurement tool than BMI. Number two, lipidema is a progressive or disorder. The majority of these patients are obese, which can increase, but the lipodystrophic process probably doesn't progress very much at all. Myth three, edema is an integral part of lipidema and must be continually treated. Fact is that there's no evidence that treatment for edema is at all effective unless the edema is associated with obesity and lymphedema, which is actually fairly common in these lipid, lipidemic patients. Lipidema makes you fat. The fact is that weight gain seems to be a trigger for the development of this lipidema. It's the other way around. And finally, weight reduction has no effect on lipidema. In fact, weight reduction may significantly improve the painful component of lipedema, especially using liposuction or bariatric surgery. So with venous malformations, about 80% of them of the vascular malformations are low flow, slow flow venous in origin. They can be isolated or they can be associated with uh, various entities like uh, KTS, Klippel-Trinidae syndrome, or blue rubber nevus. There is a genetic component to them. The pathophysiology is a weakened tunica media, developing higher capacitance venous conduits, and this leads to stagnant flow, inflammation, thrombosis. The symptoms are of discomfort, dysfunction, cosmetic, particularly cosmetic disfigurement, and they occur about 40% of them in the extremities, another 40% are in the head and neck, and 20% in the trunks. And any growth stimulus leads to expansion of these. Treatment will include uh, uh, surgical removal, laser therapy, either intravascular or transcutaneous, sclerotherapy, liquid or foam, but in fact, foam sclerotherapy has become a mainstay for treatment of venous malformations and may be combined with intravenous laser ablation. Ethanol sclerotherapy is, is certainly the most successful treatment, but it's associated also with the highest uh, complication rate. And these complications can include uh, tissue necrosis, nerve damage, pulmonary hypertension, and even cardiovascular collapse. So with ethanol, uh, ethanol treatment, it does require general anesthesia and really close, close cardiopulmonary monitoring. Detergent sclerotherapy, on their hand, is less potent, but it's, uh, you, you can repeat it fairly easily. It doesn't require any anesthesia, or certainly no uh, general anesthesia, and lower complication rates, particularly phlebitis. Now, a little bit about clipyltrinone. As you remember, this is a, a vascular malformation, including venous lymphatic and uh, capillary. If there is an arterial component, that's no longer uh, Clipyltrinone, it's Parks-Weber, and that's a whole different uh, treatment plan. 
It also includes bony and or muscular hypertrophy and an atypical lateral marginal varicosity. Duplex scan is key. You need to know the status of the superficial and the deep system because, and rule out an arterial component because if you're going to treat the superficial system, you need to be sure that that deep system is patent enough to be able to handle it. Also, you can do arterial studies in MRA and MRVs. And lymphocentigraphy, I do this mostly uh, to rule out a lymphatic component because very often that's not obvious and you need to know that so that if they get worse after the treatment, you'll know why. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.